Yeah. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is John Conley, and I'm uh, delighted to invite you to our uh, symposium with uh, Professor Frederica Kinkovac um, and discussion of her book, Budapest Children. I'll just say a few words of introduction and then hand the uh, floor over to uh, Professor Kinkovac. Um, she is currently a senior researcher at the Hannah Arendt Institute for Totalitarian Studies at the Technical University of Dresden. And she also lectures at Regensburg University. Um, she has held uh, numerous uh, impressive fellowships and is, is the author of uh, one other book uh, that appeared before this, this book um, entitled Written Here, Published There, How Underground Literature Crossed the Iron Curtain, which came out with CEU Press 2014, for which she run the, won the University of Southern California Book Prize in Culture and Literary Studies in 2015. She's also edited books um, and um, most recently, um, has published the subject of today's, today's talk, uh, which um, is hot off the presses, is, is that right? The 2000, and it's already appeared in paperback. So I encourage you to get your copy as soon as possible. Uh, and with that, I turn the floor over to Professor Kim. Thanks a lot for this kind invitation. And I think this will be the latest talk I have ever given because in Germany it's 2 a.m. in the morning. So please excuse me if my <laughs> responses are slower than they used to be. So first I would like to thank uh, Professor John Connelly, the Institute of European Studies, the German Historical Institute, um, and the Institute of Slavic and East European Studies and Eurasian Studies for the invitation to present today here my newly published book. Um, the book was just published uh, in July 2022. Um, after three years of COVID, I was really happy to see it now finally coming out because I must say publishing a book in during COVID times is not very pleasant uh, when all the archives and libraries are closed. So uh, the book uh, appeared with Indiana University Press in the book series, Worlds in Crisis, Refugees, Asylum and Forced Migration. Um, and it was edited by Elizabeth Dunn and Georgina Ramsey, to whom I'm incredibly thankful for having published the book. And um, the book is, has not been sort of written like that, but it's a revised version of my habilitation which I defended at Regensburg University in 2019. So uh, I would like to start uh, my talk today with a few words about how this book came into being. So in 2011, I was sitting in the reading room of the Sechini Library in Budapest, and I was trying to figure out what my next book was going to be about. I had just given birth to my uh, first daughter in 2007, and I had started to read quite a bit about pedagogy, child rearing practices. Um, then my daughter went to this uh, pretty ambiguous child care institution, the Emmy Pickler Institute in Budapest, and I started to really get excited uh, uh, about children's pedagogy and all these questions. So I was pretty sure I want to write a book in the field of the history of childhood. Um, so when I sat in the reading room of this beloved library, which you could see here, <laughs> Um, I came across a number of publications about humanitarian relief in Budapest during the First World War. Um, so I wondered how did it come that so many international humanitarian agents came to Budapest and got interested in the destitution and hunger of uh, uh, children in Budapest? Why were the American, Swiss, British humanitarians in Budapest and fed and relieved Budapest children? So, okay, I talked a bit more. So what was common uh, in terms of both books uh, in my interest was that I was sort of both times really interested in transnational topics and in transnational approach to the history of East Central Europe. And I was hoping to sort of help to question the geographic division into Eastern and Western European history. Um, and just as uh, our conference starting tomorrow tries to identify the transnational ties and connections which migration brought about, my book attempts to jointly also write a history of Budapest, however, in its transnational and transatlantic uh, trans entanglements. And perhaps a last word about my own positionality as a researcher. Um, so there was some personal motivation to get interested into Hungarian history. So I thought finally, after having managed to learn this pretty difficult 
language, I decided, okay, I'm going to use that language to write a book about Budapest, a city I really love. And the second, perhaps what is interesting is that um, I wondered, well, how does it come that I write two books about transatlantic history? Um, and that picked a turned up uh, diary of my great grandfather who uh, was um, living in San Jose in the early 19th century, was born in New York himself. My great grandmother was born in San Jose. So there was this biographical background to how did it come that I always sort of try to write the history of East Central Europe in connection with its transnational and transatlantic entanglements. Yeah, so now you see the beautiful library at St. Jimmy, uh, which still looks the same, which makes me happy that it hasn't changed much. So what are the main questions of my book? Um, so I've been trying in the past years to tackle three major questions. How did World War I and its troublesome aftermath trigger the destitution and hunger among children in Budapest. How did Budapest children and their bodies turn into a site of international humanitarian intervention? And third, how was children's suffering and relief used to trigger international reproachment and simultaneously fuel revisionist politics? So the main aim of my book is to, first of all, reconstruct how the capital city Budapest became a laboratory of transnational humanitarian child relief in post-war Europe. In the book, I deal with the causes of the post-World War I food crisis, this post-imperial displacement, the spreading of diseases and children's physical destitution. And I was regularly asked, isn't, is that, that short period of time, is that really enough for rehabilitation? And I always sort of try to answer, I think that's such a condensed period in the, uh, in modern history, I think that in the, looking at that condensed period, I think we can make sort of really a larger or ask larger questions about the 20th century. So yeah, I was interested in understanding how especially Budapest children as iconic victims of the war were used to trigger humanitarian sentiments throughout the United mm -hmm. States and Western Europe. I argue that Budapest became a social melting pot in the post-war period, which ideally mirrors the larger reconfigurations at the time. While the war's aftermath was a condensed period of historical change, I argue that Budapest itself was a condensed space of transformation. And then I look at various ways to improve children's lives, such as food relief, children's strains, the better of countries after the war, children's holiday programs, children's workrooms, and the making of children's welfare. Here I investigate the dynamic interplay between local humanitarian agents and the international uh, uh, dimension. And third, uh, I always try to sort of also incorporate uh, the perspective of the child recipients. And I was particularly concerned with everyday practices of transatlantic relief, meaning relief provided by the United States, Britain, and international relief organizations. And last, I wish to provide a glimpse into the social turmoil of the aftermath of war in post-imperial Central Europe. Here I'm trying to understand uh, how post-war internationalism and nationalism were intertwined uh, or came to be closely intertwined at the time. This is why I picked this image for the book. It ideally captures how children's hunger, humanitarian relief, and territorial revisionism were deeply connected at the time. You see here an American lunch delivered to starving children in a school facility in Budapest, where a revisionist poster, Nam Nam Shoha, on the back, no, no, never, calls for the revocation of the Treaty of Trianon. In this image, the plight of the starving children is directly set in relation with the plight for the country's territorial recovery. So what archival research did I conduct uh, to sort of pursue these questions? And I cannot say that I answered all these questions, but I was pursuing this and I was looking for answers. So as the relief action was international, also the archival research was international. So I was trying to conduct research in various countries. I did archival research in Budapest, uh, in the Uber archives in Stanford, the Save the Children archives in Birmingham, Geneva. 
the Red Cross archives in Washington and Geneva and National Archives in London, Vienna and Washington. Here you see some images of the Hungarian National Museum, the Hoover Institution Archives, the Cadbury Library in Birmingham, and the Save the Children Archives. So in these archives, I was confronted with a large bulk of written sources, including letters, reports, statistics, but I found also masses of images, so visuals. Um, so I was trying to sort of incorporate these photographies into the body of um, sources that I encountered. I also found uh, drawings uh, by children, uh, handwritten letters. Uh, so how do you deal with this very different and diverse spark of sources? It was for me pretty challenging. But I was always sort of searching for the sources that would allow me to write a culture and transnational history of hunger and relief. I wanted to understand how children's hunger and the destitution were represented in the contemporaneous discourse, what this children's history can tell us about the post-war transformation and how the transnational connections played out in the city of Budapest. So the book is divided into nine chapters. When I wrote the habilitation, it was, had an absolutely different structure. But as you know, American publishers are not so keen on publishing a very long and extensive German habilitation. So I had to rewrite it pretty extensively and put it into nine chapters. Uh, I deal in the first chapter with the massive migration after the war. Um, so migration from the ceded territories and what that did to the city of Budapest. I look at in chapter two at how hunger affected the city and its children. In chapter three, I analyze how the child's body came to sort of embody Hungary's post-war condition. Then I shift in chapter four to the origination of local Hungarian child protection, because it's not just the history of international humanitarian relief in Budapest, but I really tried to look at the entanglements and the connections between the local and the global. Um, then I look in chapter five and six at the infrastructure of humanitarian relief and how the feeding actually took place. And in chapter seven, I look, I think that's perhaps, uh, yeah, I think one of the core chapters of the book, uh, what is the political agenda be behind the whole relief um, activities. And in chapter eight and nine, these are two chapters where I look at two specific types of relief. In chapter eight, I look at all these children's strains, 50,000 Hungarian children were sent abroad. And in chapter nine, it was a way to teach children to provide for themselves uh, in the so-called workrooms. I wanna start uh, with the observation of an American eyewitness who visited Budapest in 1921. The American Captain Trentis Terry went to see it Quote, I visited a children's hospital and there were shameful and disgusting sights. In one room, I saw newborn babes wrapped in paper, lying around in no linen of any kind. Some of them have mothers, most of them don't. The room was dirty, stale and nauseating. I wonder the babies breathe at all. I've seen hell of, on the battlefield, but this side was worse than that. Such eyewitness reports which sometimes, which sometimes tend to dramatize explicitly children's situation were widely circulated, often translated from Hungarian into French or English to reach a wider audience. Furthermore, I do not claim in my book that Budapest children were exceptional in their suffering. Um, the social implications of post-war transformation affected most post-imperial states and capitals, such as Vienna, Prague. Um, these cities were particularly condensed spaces of post-war turmoil. Already during the war, they had turned into nerve centers, as Jay Winter calls them. Budapest was simply one of these nerve centers, yet I argue it's a telling one. It went not only through a severe political and economic crisis at the time, an economic blockade, a Bolshevist revolution, the white terror and territorial loss. It also witnessed massive immigration from the ceded territories, high unemployment and housing crisis. Even a New York Times article from 1920 
describe Budapest as the capital of human misery. In that sense, this case study of Budapest allows for a distinctive insight into the European post-war period. So why is it valuable to focus much attention on the ways children's bodies were depicted, fed, treated, embedded into the political discourse of the time? Children's bodies reflect how the post-war altered the lives and bodies of ordinary pe people. Children's bodies show how they were impacted by the hunger crisis in the capital city, the Spanish flu, but also the compromising living conditions at the time. The fact that children's physical degeneration was closely documented, both visually and in detailed eyewitness reports, demonstrates that a new awareness of children's value emerged. One that feared the degeneration of the quote, human material. Furthermore, the physical appearance of children's bodies decided over children's access to humanitarian relief. To be eligible to receive food, children's bodies had to show feeding the physics. Here we see images of two minorist children who were recruited in Budapest for the breakfast action of the American Relief Administration. Their bodies were examined for signs of malnourishment. These bodies bore little resemblance to the ideal of the well-fed middle-class children that were to become the future of the Hungarian nation. Closely documenting children's corporal destitution and suffering served to denounce the loss of a whole generation if nothing would be done. So how did the image of the suffering child gain international publicity? I argue in my book that the hungry and destitute children turned into a universal icon of the post-war period that was useful to evoke feelings of pity and compassion for the suffering populations throughout Europe. In various archives, as you see here, I found the very same images, differently framed with different captions, always adapted to the specific viewing customs of the uh, audiences. So the circulating pictures mirrored both the internationalization of knowledge about the condition of Budapest children and the creation of a transnational humanitarian community. Some images were recycled over and over again. The captions here show how the relief organizations approached the icons of post-war suffering, employing them to represent and speak for universal suffering. And I think that's what I try to get at. So Budapest children were used not just to talk about Hungarian history and Hungarian uh, loss of territories, but it was also sort of an embodiment of post-war suffering. As humanitarian imagery had to target both Hungarian as well as home societies with humanitarian propaganda, the contemporaneous media modified these images and adapted them to the specific viewing practices. Images were always uh, were also used to contrast children's lives and bodies in poverty stricken Budapest and in better off countries. The caption identifies Budapest's rickety children as, quote, distorted through the lack of proper food and nourishment. You see here on the left. The contrasting image on the right shows, quote, little Miss Hazel Nielsen Terry with her mother at the Snowball Valley at Hyde Park Hotel. These contrasting images of child life in two European cities combine a fundamental critique of the wealth of the better of classes in Britain with a moral appeal to the empathy towards Budapest hungry and physically disabled children. In response to uh, the suffering of Budapest children, I look in the book also at uh, the ways in which local welfare organizations uh, responded to the crisis and aim to provide relief. Um, I, I, I argue in the book that Hungarian local child protection was pretty modern, although it was always sort of perceived by the Americans who came into Hungary like as backward and was supposed to be represented like that. But in itself, it was a very advanced, modern and professional system already. However, um, these child protective institutions after the war found themselves in a precarious financial and material situation, which led the foundation for the incoming, incoming humanitarian relief that was provided. For instance, you see here the 
the Hungarian League of Child Protection uh, was unable to appropriate, appropriately meet children's most basic needs. So they sought financial and material uh, help abroad. The left image was a postcard um, that was circulated internationally to both draw attention to Hungary's needs and to the quantity of international material donations. Because down here, American international uh, donations are delivered to the Hungarian institution. To draw attention to children suffering, not just of Hungary's children, but in, uh, in Central Europe as a whole, much publicity was made abroad. This poster from 1920 called up in Britain society to help save the children of Central Europe. The experience of the war triggered in various countries the aspiration to protect Europe's children if they wanted to prevent the decline of their respective post war nations. Hygienic ideas shaped and influenced these child bearing discourses. The Hungarian physician Dr. Ödön Levi called in 1918 on the government court do not allow the war to destroy the child in that way also the regeneration of the Hungarian nation. Levi drew a parallel between the corporal condition of the starving child and the physical and mental constitution of Hungary's future nation. So on the basis of uh, and in close cooperation with local uh, child protective organizations, massive international relief organization was provided. And in my book, I'm trying to uncover how children's relief evolved into a local undertaking. Uh, among the relief organizations I look at are the American Relief Administration and its European Children Fund, the British Save the Children Fund and its international union, the American Red Cross, um, which you see here distributing food to Budapest children and the International Committee of the Red Cross Societies. To implement the relief, uh, a number of international relief agents had to sort of come to Budapest and become active. On the left, we see here Count Rodolf de Redingiberg, who served from 1919 onwards as a delegate of the International Committee of the Red Cross to Budapest. In the middle, Julia Weikal, who not only headed the Hungarian League of Child Protection and served as a local relief worker, Wojka, I would argue, was a connecting link between the local and the international arena and never could find her personal archives. So if ever anyone hears of a local depository, I would be more than keen to sort of look at those archives. Um, so she considered her job to serve as a transnational mediator of knowledge about the situation of Hungary's school. And on the right, you see James Pedlo, Familiarly, familiarly known as Uncle Pedlo from the American Red Cross, whom I would also consider the key figure of American relief in Budapest. He embodied the economic, military, and political, political power of the US by being very dedicated to the plight of Budapest children. So, what kind of relief activities I look at in my book? I was particularly concerned with children's feeding, as hunger seemed to have affected children's lives severely. From the summer of 1919, the American child feeding started in Budapest. It operated through uh, schools, hospitals, kindergartens, and orphanages. Children could receive one meal a day. On the left, we see the official opening of the American child feeding. On every single table, you find an American flag creating the direct link between the provided food and the American origins in children's minds. Emphasis was also laid, as you see here on the right image, on the relief of pregnant uh, and nursing women uh, and of infants because they were considered, considered crucial in enabling the rescue of the Hungarian nation. So um, they were not the enemy in this post war period, but they were sort of considered as the future of the Hungarian state. Um, and they were worthy of relief. It's always a question of who is worthy of receiving donation, clothing, food, etc. Um, the free uh, milk stations offered a free breakfast to them, as we see here. While there existed various forms to relieve the children's suffering, especially children's temporary uh, vacations and evacuations, children's trains, and a number of uh, terminology with which these uh, this practices um, described. Here we see a group of Hungarian children consuming lunch during their stay 
at the Adriatic Sea in Abasia from 1920, also international uh, child transports were initiated. Around 50 or 60,000 Hungarian children were sent to Holland, Belgium, Switzerland, Sweden, and England. And many of these children stayed not only for several weeks, but months or never returned home. And I conducted a handful of interviews still with children from that time. Um, that's one of the drawings and the contemporary media are full of these drawings uh, related to children's suffering and to children's relief. Here we have an image, foreign countries for Hungarian children, their stereotypical foster parents are taking the children away. And the last relief activity I'm looking at were the so-called work rooms. Uh, while American Food Relief provided a sort of thought rather of the uh, emergency relief, uh, let's feed these children, uh, save the children, was more interested in the education of the children and the rehabilitation. Um, Julia Baika, who we had seen earlier, she established uh, 14 workrooms, which you see here, uh, in the poorer quarters of Budapest to provide children with the opportunity to learn a useful craft. And many of these workrooms did not only exist throughout the 20s, but uh, I found references to them in the 30s and even 40s. So it's something I would say you can really see the shift from emergency relief of the early 20s to um, uh, attitude towards children to rather provide for themselves, to learn a craft, to be able to earn a living. So here they learned uh, handicrafts such as lace making, shoe making, dress making, sewing, basket making, etc. Many of these crafts were very particularly Hungarian. And uh, you can see many of these images where nationalism was really inscribed into this handicraft. Um, the handicrafted objects conveyed two messages. First, that education was the way to fight children's poverty and starvation. And second, that knowledge and self-help would be the means by which Hungary could liberate itself from the economic dependency from international relief. At the same time, I show in my book that Budapest children came to play a key role in post-war political debates. Here we see a French caricature which captured the case of Hungary's children. We find ourselves in the year 1920 on 15th of January, published just days before the closure of the Paris Peace Conference and a few months before the signing of the Treaty of Trianon on June 20. It uses Hungary's hungry children as a means to harshly criticize Calls for politics towards Hungary. The caricature shows four children. The oldest child on the left, dressed as a French Prime Minister, Georges Clemenceau, suggests, On va jouer à la Hongrie. Vous vous criverez de faim. Moi, je suis Clemenceau et je rigole. Translate We are going to play Hungary. You will starve of hunger while I am Clemenceau and love. Using the idea of a child's hunger game serves here to denounce the very victorious nations and especially Clemenceau, who served as president of the peace conference for playing after World War I a hunger game with Hungary's children. This caricature appears like a last rebellion against the peace conditions. Beyond the larger post-war politics, the story of Budapest children can uncover also how the involved countries profited politically from this transnational humanitarian endeavor. I argue that it provided the US with the opportunity to display America's modernity and economic power. An image was projected of the United States as a selfless, altruistic nation, while it could expand its sphere of economic and political influence. Key American relief workers in Budapest, such as James Fedlow, whom you see here on the right, were turning into humanitarian celebrities in Budapest. In the 1922 farewell note on the left, uh, to when Pedro left Budapest, um, his name was written into the cityscape of Budapest. His role as a bridge between the US, Geneva, and the city of Budapest is symbolized through the joint arrangement of the American flag, the Red Cross flag, and the flag of the city of Budapest. So the capital's appreciation for his deeds was literally carved into stone when a statue of him was erected in Budapest City Park. And now we come to how Hungary profited from the relief. Also, post for Hungary could profit from the relief action. 
I argue that it used the discourse over its suffering child population to rewrite its international reputation from an enemy to a victim uh, nation. Exhibiting children's corporal destitution was very useful to draw attention to Hungary's post-war condition. The icon of the suffering child enabled Hungary to gain support from international donors that were willing to rescue the child's body. And in that way, also Hungary's impaired national body. Fears of a further declining population and the collectively harmed physique of the future generation were ideal ammunition to demand a revision of Hungary's territorial losses. At the same time, Hungary used international relief facilities to exhibit her national sentiment and strengthened children's national belonging. Why the war poster here on the left again claims uh, or asks for the uh, revision of the territorial losses, the image here on the right captures a typical Hungarian folkloristic celebration at a relief facility. Children were considered an ideal material from which to build the new Hungarian nation and lobby for it abroad. So what conclusions do I aim to draw in my book? First, I argue that the destitution and relief of Budapest children served to foster a new international awareness for the need of their special protection and for the transnationalization of aid. Second, to visualize the suffering of the nascent Hungarian nation state. Children's corporal destitution helped to institutionalize the rhetoric of Hungary's victimhood. And you can still see that very much in today's discourses. And third, it helped also to alter, I would argue, post-war mentalities, while also anchoring patterns of economic and political inequality. And last, so in what field sort of I'm seeing my book sort of or possibly making a contribution, I see myself as contributing to the visual and cultural history of hunger and food relief, second uh, to the social history of the aftermath of the First World War, third to the history of migration and displacement, um, then it is a trans transnational history of Central European childhood. So I do not just write the history of Hungarian children, and I'm regularly asked if I'm a Hungarian historian. No, I do not see myself as a typical Hungarian historian, but I look at Hungarian ch children in their entanglements and in their international ties. And last, it is uh, I'm attempting to sort of write a trans transatlantic history of humanitarianism looking both at Eastern and Western Europe. And my last slide, I would like to use the opportunity to thank the huge number of people without whom this project could have not been completed and this book could have not been um, published. First, I would like to thank Ulf Brunbar from Regensburg University, uh, under whose supervision I wrote the habilitation. Um, and I don't think I could have um, yeah, I've written that book without your um, support. And um, then I was very um, happy to have Heide Fehrenbach, Paul Hanebrick, and Patriona Kelly as the supervisors of my um, habilitation, and Elizabeth Dunn, who came to uh, Regensburg University once as a fellow, and she uh, supported me throughout the publication process. Then I had a fellowship at my Katis colleague and Professor Joachim von Puttgammer was very important in sort of giving feedback on the on the on drafts and presentations of the book. The Institute for Advanced Studies, I had time there to write uh, to discuss my project with as colleagues. And last, um, since 2018, I'm at the Hannah Arendt Institute for Totalitarian Studies, and I'm very thankful as well for the support throughout the publication process because some funding is also needed to get the book published, to get, get the book copy edited, uh, revised, etc. So uh, yeah, it was a long process from the habilitation to the final book publication, but I'm very happy for the support in those years. And, uh, you know, I'm a, not a native of the English speaker, so a number of people corrected my language and helped me also to not forget all the as and is on the Hungarian 
vocals because um, Hungarian is neither my native language. Um, yeah, I had a very good experience with Indiana University, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's not the best to publish a book in COVID times, but nevertheless, it was a pretty um, uncomplicated process from the submission to the publication. Yeah, and I think every book is not, cannot be written without the many archives, libraries, and a number of interview partners who, um, with whom I could spend time to talk about this period. Yeah, and my family, I think that's the most important because if they had not supported me throughout the project, I could have not, could not gone to these many archives and presented my work at different places. So thanks for all the support and I'm happy the book is finally out.